consequence, we are fooling ourselves. The doomsday is coming. We must put a boundary around the United States Congress to be able to balance our budget. In 1995, when this failed by one vote, we will forever regret that if this occurs again. It's time for us to balance our budget once and for all. With that, I yield back. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, I yield to the distinguished gentlelady from Ohio, Marsha Fudge, two minutes. The gentlelady from Ohio is recognized for two minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to speak in opposition to the balanced budget amendment, H.J. Res 2. Despite its name, this amendment does not balance the budget. It would have little effect on our deficit, but could seriously harm our economy. It would destroy jobs, drastically cut Medicare and Social Security, and unconstitutionally give federal judges the power to make spending decisions. And this amendment does not even require a balanced budget every year. What it does is make it easier to cut taxes and more difficult to raise taxes in order to allocate money to important programs that protect our veterans, our seniors, and our most vulnerable. It could also allow federal judges to have the final say on taxing and spending decisions. No one knows if amending the Constitution to require a balanced federal budget will actually reduce the debt. No one knows if it could prevent the debt from growing in the future. What we do know is that when Democrats controlled Congress, PAYGO was effective in reigning in spending. And what we do know is that this amendment is not the answer. If a balanced budget requirement were to go into effect, it would destroy millions of jobs. If the budget were balanced through spending cuts, those cuts would come to about $1.5 trillion in 2012. This would throw 15 million more Americans out of work, double the unemployment rate to approximately 18 percent, and cause the economy to shrink by 17 percent. Republicans, as part of their budget proposal, have made it clear they want to cut Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. By requiring a balanced budget, these programs would be directly on the chopping block. According to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, this amendment could force Congress to cut all programs by an average of 17.3 percent by 2018. If, resonu if revenues are not raised, Medicare could be cut by about $750 billion. Democrats have balanced the budget before, and we will do it again without harming the economy. This amendment is nothing more than a Republican political diversion, and I urge my colleagues to vote no. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentlelady has expired. The gentleman from Texas. Mr. Speaker, I'll yield one and a half minutes to the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Fortenberry. The gentleman from Nebraska is recognized for one and one half minutes. Thank the gentleman from Texas. Mr. Speaker, I have long supported a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution, and I don't take the issue lightly of amending our Constitution, which has endured through strife and dramatic historical shifts with very few amendments. Constitutional amendments should be exceedingly rare as they have the power to spur sweeping change. But I do believe it is necessary that the same process that guaranteed our hallmark freedoms of speech and religion and freedom from slavery be used to protect our children and future generations from economic collapse. Most states, including Nebraska, have already enacted balanced budget requirements. My state has to live within its means. The federal government needs to do the same. Mr. Speaker, we are standing at history's door. We can either lead and be bold, making the hard decisions necessary to correct this fiscal trajectory, or stay in our time-worn political lanes, continuing with the status quo that has given our nation this unsustainable debt burden. We can do something big for this country and our future and make deficit spending a thing of the past. This is a significant moment. I urge that we pass this bill. It has expired. The gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased now to recognize uh, the indomitable gentlelady from Illinois, Jan Schakowsky, for two minutes. The gentlelady from Illinois is recognized for two minutes. I rise in opposition to the balanced budget amendment. You know, it was just a decade ago that President Clinton left office with not just a balanced budget, but a surplus. And we got there by a one-vote margin. No Republican votes whatsoever. 
And here we are today, after eight years and two wars and two tax cuts uh, that were paid for on the credit card, mainly benefiting the wealthy and a devastating recession that could have been prevented by had financial regulators not turned a blind eye to Wall Street. And now we're debating an amendment to the Constitution that offers anything but balance. This amendment would destroy the budget and in the process wipe out jobs and eviscerate Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, extended unemployment benefits, as well as education and cancer research and veterans and bridge repair and food inspection and you name a program, and this amendment will put it at risk. Balanced budget amendment could force Congress to cut all programs by an average of 17.3 percent by 2018. This amendment would limit the ability of the federal government to respond to national crises, including an economic or natural disaster. It would virtually guarantee that recessions turn into depressions. This amendment will require a supermajority to raise the debt ceiling, a reckless requirement given how close we came to defaulting earlier this year when just a simple majority was required. And I'm really tired of hearing Republicans say, well, if states and families must balance their budgets, so should the federal government. The states have to balance their operating budgets, but they can still borrow for capital projects. And families have to manage their budgets, but they can do so by incurring debt. Home mortgages, student loans, car loans, payments for medical bills. This amendment blocks the federal government from making investments in the same way. And suppose in 2008, when the deficit seemed manageable, we had a balanced budget amendment. Um, the effect on the economy would be catastrophic if the 2012 balanced budget were, uh, budget were balanced through spending cuts. Those cuts, it is predicted by macroeconomic advisors. I yield the gentle lady 15 additional seconds. Gentle lady is recognized for 15 seconds. Macroeconomics, uh, a nonpartisan forecasting firm, said that those cuts would throw about 15 million more people out of work, double the unemployment rate from 9% to about 18%, and cause the economy to shrink by about 17% instead of growing by an expected 2%. This amendment will only make the economy worse. Vote no. Mayor. Gentleman from Texas. Mr. Speaker, I'll yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from Washington State, Ms. McMorris Rogers, who is also a member of the Republican leadership. Gentlelady from Washington is recognized for two minutes. I appreciate the gentleman yielding. James Madison said that the trickiest question the Constitutional Conf uh, Convention confronted was how to oblige a government to control itself. History records not a single nation that spent and borrowed it and taxed its way to prosperity. But it offers us many, many examples of nations that spent and borrowed and taxed their way into economic ruin and bankruptcy. And history is screaming to us a warning that nations that bankrupt themselves aren't around very long because, you can, because before you can provide for the common defense and promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty, you have to be able to pay for it. Today I rise in strong support of the balanced budget amendment. This last weekend I reread the 1995 House Judiciary Committee report that accompanied the resolution that passed at that time. Incredibly, the same justifications put forward against the balanced budget amendment in 1995 are the same ones that we hear today. First, the report highlights a $4.7 trillion debt in 1995, discusses the implications of a $200 billion interest payment. I only wish those were the debt levels we are responding to today. What this comparison means is that we haven't corrected the government spending problem on our own. Our debt has more than tripled and interest payments more than doubled in the last two decades. All we have to show for over that time is that we have a spending problem. In fact, we have an addiction. And I don't see that addiction going away unless we pass HJR Resolution 2. Where would we be today? if the balanced budget amendment had passed the Senate in 1997 and it had been sent to the states. I guarantee we would not be facing a total debt of $15 trillion or a $450, $450 billion interest payment. And so we must get, ask ourselves, where will we be five to ten years from now without a balanced budget amendment? I urge my colleagues to stop the cycle of overspending. Support this amendment. Time of the gentlelady has expired. The gentleman from Texas.
or Michigan. I apologize to the gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, I yield to the former chair of the Progressive Caucus, Lynn Woolsey, the gentlelady from California, two minutes. The gentlelady from California is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, a ranking member, for this time. Uh, earlier this year, economist uh, Bruce Bartlett, who served in the Reagan and Bush administrations, had this to say about an earlier Republican balanced budget amendment. He said, and I quote him, it looks like it was drafted by a couple of interns on the back of a napkin. Granted, he was talking about a different version, but I still say, that was pretty unfair to interns who I think could do a lot better than this amendment, amendment that we're debating today. If uh, the balanced budget were in place today, it would cripple the economy and decimate Social Security, Medicare, veterans programs, among many others. The austerity dogma of the Republican majority, their balanced budget fetish, is hurting America, not helping it. We need more federal dollars pumped into this economy. We need it to stimulate demand and to create jobs. We don't need less. If you get caught in a rainstorm, I mean, I wouldn't want to be caught in a rainstorm with the other side of anybody on the other side of the aisle because I'd be afraid that they'd propose a constitutional amendment banning umbrellas. Call me old-fashioned, Mr. Speaker, but I think amending the Constitution is a pretty big deal. It should be reserved for correcting gross injustices and expanding fundamental rights. For decades, I've been among those pushing for a constitutional amendment that enshrines the notion that women should be treated equally. Republicans want no part of that, but they're eager for a constitutional amendment that shreds the safety net and could cause another recession for our country. No thanks. Vote no on this balanced budget amendment. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back her time. The gentleman from Texas. Mr. Speaker, I will yield two minutes to the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Nunnally. The gentleman from Mississippi is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I came to this body, I chaired the Appropriations Committee in the Mississippi Senate. I worked with my counterpart in the other chamber, Democrat, Chairman Johnny Stringer. We crafted three balanced budgets because Chairman Stringer and I shared a commitment to a principle that you can't spend more money than you take in. One thing I learned is that there are always more needs, more requests, than there are available resources. And that fact causes you to have to make some difficult decisions. We made those difficult decisions in the Mississippi State House. In fact, there are 49 states that require that around the nation. Municipal, county governments are making those difficult decisions. More importantly, families are making those decisions sitting around the kitchen table, and small businesses are making those decisions tonight. And if they're willing to live within their means, they have every reason to expect their government in Washington to do the same thing. This balanced budget amendment has been a dream of leaders in this body since Thomas Jefferson. Sixteen years ago, we had bipartisan support and came within one vote of getting it adopted. I welcome the support of those Democrats that are stepping up and giving bipartisan support to this measure. We must have a balanced budget amendment to rein in spending so that we can create jobs. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Mississippi yields back his time. The gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, Steny Hoyer has been working in leadership for many years. He is now our distinguished whip, and I recognize him for five minutes. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairman for yielding. Mr. Speaker, in 1995, I spoke on the floor in support of a balanced budget amendment. That was 16 years ago. There's a lot of water over the bridge since that time. I said then, and I quote, I do so because I believe that this country confronts a critical threat caused by the continuation of large annual deficits. I believe that then, and I believe it now. 
and I have voted against tax cuts that weren't paid for. I voted against Social Security benefits that weren't paid for, and I voted against other items that weren't paid for. I stand by my 1995 statement today. However, as I have said, events in the last 16 years lead me to oppose today's bill's uh, balanced budget amendment. Only months after we had that debate, my Republican colleagues shut down the government. In 1997, we passed an amendment with bipartisan agreement reaffirming the 1990 agreement uh, that we would have a PAYGO process in place. And without having passed a balanced budget amendment, we did in fact balance the budget four years in a row. Why? Because we paid for what we bought. We didn't cut revenues before we cut spending. And we restrained spending four years in a row. I tell my Republican friends, none of you in your lifetime has lived during the course of a president who had four balanced budget. Were you partially responsible? Absolutely. Were we partially responsible? Absolutely. But what was the lesson? That we didn't need an amendment, we needed the will and the courage. Without having passed that balanced budget amendment under President Clinton, not only were we able to balance the budget, but we also achieved the only president term in the lifetime of anybody in this chamber or listening to me that had four years of balance and a net surplus. Hear me, a net surplus at the end of 96 months as President of the United States. We made it happen not with a balanced budget amendment, but because we had the will to do so and by following PAYGO rules. Sadly, I tell my colleagues and the American people, Mr. Speaker, under President Bush, Republicans exploded the deficit and abandoned PAYGO, along with the principle that we ought to pay for what we buy. We do not have a spending problem or a revenue problem. We have a pay-for problem. The Republican Congress spent enormous sums on two wars, a prescription drug program, and tax cuts without paying for them. If you have the courage of your convictions, you pay for things. Spending rose at a level nearly twice the inflation rate that Bill Clinton's rose in spending during the eight years of the Bush administration when Republicans were in charge of everything for six years and had a president who could veto anything that we did for two. When the financial crisis hit in 2008, President Bush told us that if we have failed to act, there would be a high risk of depression. What did the president's party do? You say you have a three-fifths vote if there's an emergency. President Bush told us that if we did not act, there would be a depression. And in fact, we had a vote. And that vote was 205 to 228, with two-thirds of the president's party voting against the president in what he called a crisis. That gives me, I tell my friends on the Republican side, no confidence that in time of danger and crisis that we could summon three-fifths vote. I believed in 1995 we could summon those votes because, frankly, we were a much more bipartisan and, in my opinion, responsible body. But I do not have that confidence today, and I am not prepared to take that risk. My party, of course, voted with President Bush because we thought there was a crisis. Now, a few days after that, we came back to vote, and we did pass it. But I tell my friend, I have an additional minute. Apparently, we're running out of time. I tell my I, I grant one additional minute. I Gentleman from Arrow is recognized for one additional minute. I tell my friends that even on the second vote, when we did, in fact, pass that bill that President Bush asked us to pass because there was a crisis, he could not summon the majority of your party to support him. 
barely three-fifths, notwithstanding the president's assertion of crisis, voted to meet that crisis, with 172 Democrats voting with President Bush in a bipartisan response to crisis. Earlier this year, again in control of the House, Republicans brought the government to the brink of shutdown. Over the summer, we saw them hold the country hostage by pushing us to the brink of default. In the first time in my memory, the United States of America to the brink of default. I have not changed my beliefs about balancing the budget. And I invite all of you to vote with me on paying for things that we buy, not passing those costs along to my children, my grandchildren, and my two great-grandchildren. We have shown we can do it. We balanced the budget for four years. Don't talk about it. Just do it. Don't spend the, re the refuse. Don't refuse to pay for it. Don't cut taxes and increase spending. Ten additional seconds. Granted. Gentleman is recognized for ten additional seconds. Don't just preach fiscal responsibility. Practice it. It will take no courage to vote for this amendment, but it will take courage to balance our budget by paying for what we buy. I yield back the balance of my time. The time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Texas. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield myself 15 seconds. The gentleman is recognized for 15 seconds. Mr. Speaker, seconds. I just want to point out for the record that all of the balanced budgets enacted during the Clinton administration were, in fact, proposed by a Republican Congress. I happened to be a member of the Budget Committee at the time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'll yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Will Miller. Will my friend yield? The gentlelady from Michigan is recognized yield? for my two minutes. My friend won't yield. All right. The gentlelady from Michigan is recognized for two minutes. Uh, thank the gentleman for yielding. And Mr. Speaker, our Constitution is certainly the greatest governing document ever created by man. It's the bedrock foundation for this, the United States of America, the greatest nation on earth. And Mr. Speaker, our founding fathers in their genius provided us with a way to amend the Constitution to deal with a changing world. James Madison, who of course is widely seen as the father of the Constitution, once said that a public debt, debt is a public curse. In 1995, this House passed a very similar balanced budget amendment to the one that we are considering today. The amendment received 300 votes in this House, but fell just one vote short in the United States Senate. And since that time, Mr. Speaker, our national debt has grown by over $9 trillion. Yes, $9 trillion, including nearly $4 trillion in new debt in just the last three years. And today, the debt is over $15 trillion. And the fact of the matter is that our public debt has become the public curse of which Madison warned us. The American people understand that this level of debt is not sustainable, and that is why they overwhelmingly support this balanced budget amendment. And today we have a choice, Mr. Speaker. Do we answer the call of the American people and embrace fiscal responsibility, or do we continue the status quo of more spending and more borrowing and more debt? It's time for this Congress to use the tools our Founding Fathers gave us, Mr. Speaker, to amend the Constitution to save further generations from the shackles of unsustainable debt. And I would urge my colleagues to join me in supporting this common-sense amendment to balance our federal budget. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back her time. The gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, I yield to the distinguished gentleman from St. Louis, Missouri, Lacey Clay. Two minutes. The gentleman from Missouri is recognized for two minutes. I thank my friend from Michigan for yielding. My Democratic colleagues have spoken and will speak eloquently on the numbers. They have or will correctly point to the millions of jobs and the balanced budget amendment would certainly destroy. However, I want to talk uh, about the personal impact of this irresponsible legislation. For example, Social Security recipients should not be held responsible for Congress's reckless acts. Radically cutting Social Security hurts Americans. Drastically cutting Medicare hurts Americans. Enormous cuts to defense and homeland security measures, to food stamps, to veterans' pensions, and supplemental security income for the elderly, disabled, 
hurts Americans. It hurts America and makes us less safe and secure. And make no mistake, this legislation requires these massive cuts. Some have claimed that these cuts will not be necessary under this legislation, or worse, that they are necessary and good. They claim that cutting benefits to the most vulnerable Americans is good, that destroying jobs, destroying lives is good. Mr. Speaker, it is not. It is not good. It is not good to balance the budget on the backs of those who can least bear the burden. It is not good to balance the budget by taking away from those who have so little. This is exactly what the balanced budget amendment would do, and it takes away from medical care for seniors. That means more of our elderly unable to afford their medication, unable to get needed tests and treatments, and more Americans hurting. It destroys jobs. That means more Americans out of work, more Americans unable to pay their bills, and more American families, I thank you. No seconds. And more American families hurting. You know, Hubert Humphrey said it best. He said the moral test of government is how that government treats those who are in the dawn of their life, the children, those who are in the twilight of their life, the elderly, and those who are in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy and disabled. This reckless legislation fails all tests. Thank you. Expired. The gentleman from Texas. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from Washington, Ms. Herrera Butler. The gentlelady from Washington is recognized for two minutes. Winston Churchill said that Americans can always be counted on to do the right thing after they've, they've exhausted all other possibilities. You know, what's interesting about this quote is it actually applies to this institution. What have we tried? We've tried billion dollar bailouts for auto companies. We've tried billion dollar bailouts for Wall Street fat cats, not for Main Street. We've, we've done bailouts for automakers. We've thrown money at everything and we have added so much to our national debt in the last four years. Republicans did it too. Doesn't make it right. So, are we better off than we were four years ago? No, in, in Southwest Washington State, we still have rampant unemployment and joblessness. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I'm no economist. I'm not the distinguished minority leader who I respect. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm just an average American that understands a very simple truth. You cannot spend more than you have. That's all this amendment does. That's it. We're not cutting Social Security. We're not cutting Medicare. We would not. We're actually protecting those programs by saying this federal government is going to live within the money that it takes from the, from the taxpayers every year, no more, no less. It's, it's very, very simple. You don't have to be an economist to understand that if you spend more money than you have every year, you have a problem. Our problem is $15 trillion worth of back-breaking debt. We don't have to look much further than Europe to know that no country can exist under debt like this for, so, for too long. We're actually taking steps to protect our poor and vulnerable by putting sideboards around the reckless spending of this Congress. With this amendment, we're cutting up the credit card that is going to break the backs of the American people and cost us more jobs. I urge my colleagues to join us in solutions, in bipartisan solutions that are going to bring an, an opportunity for America to prosper and succeed. A no vote is putting people under and, and putting politics above. We need to reverse that and put people before politics. I urge a yes vote. Yield back. Time of the gentlelady has expired. The gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself as much time as I'm, I may consume. And is recognized for as much time as he may the consume. The gentlelady from Washington, uh, I, was, I listened to her very carefully, and she has promulgated one of the greatest misunderstandings in this de debate, namely that the Social Security and Highway Trust Fund are not jeopardized by House Joint Resolution, Resolution 2 because Section 7 excludes repayment of debt principle from the definition of total outlays. Now, 
according to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. The balanced budget amendment could result in Medicare being cut by about $750 billion, Social Security almost $1.2 trillion, and the Veterans Benefits $85 billion through 2021 if cuts were spread proportionally. So I hope that there will be fewer and fewer of my colleagues uh, trying to assure us uh, that uh, the, this bill does not jeopardize those programs. This, I, this is from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. And I reserve the balance of my time and I yield to the distinguished member of the committee Sheila Jackson Lee for three minutes. The gentlelady from Texas is recognized for three minutes. Thank the speaker. I thank the uh, ranking member of this committee. Many of us could spend a lot of time on educating the public on just what is occurring. We cherish this little book that has lasted in this nation for some more than more than centuries that we could count uh, as this document was written the question was going to ask or was asked whether it could last and today we cite the United States as the longest democracy holding on to a constitution that provides us with the opportunity to even be here but it is important to note that in order to amend the Constitution, the Founding Fathers were so serious about how important a action this would be that they indicated that there should be two-thirds votes from both the House and the Senate and three-quarters of our states, the people of the United States, must likewise answer the call. Frankly, let me make a pronouncement. The American people will not answer this foolish call. They will recognize that whether it's super committees or tea parties and others that want to distract away from the reasonable approach to budgeting, which is revenue enhancement and serious reform, uh, they know that the way they do their budget is thoughtfulness and not rushing to judgment. A headline on the markup of our bill in committee, though I know this is not, it says Sheila Jackson Lee can't slow down Republican balanced budget amendment freight train. That train keeps coming, and in the midst of it, there are bloody bodies left along the wayside. Our chairman of the Federal Reserve said, we really don't want to just cut, cut, cut. Uh, chairman Bernanke said, you need to be a little bit cautious about sharp cuts in every near term because of the potential impact on the recovery. That doesn't at all preclude, in fact, I believe it's entirely consistent with a longer-term program that will bring our budget into a sustainable position. Uh, additional seconds. The gentlelady is recognized for 30 additional seconds. I thank you very much. And so uh, for us to go this route, it means that uh, even in a war, it is a complicated process of a majority vote, uh, even beside the declaration of war, even in an emergency, uh, when our soldiers are needing more resources, we have to come to this body and stop uh, and wait for our soldiers to get what their resources are. We have to stop and wait for our veterans to get the resources that they need. While veterans' hospitals are closing, while centers for post-traumatic stress disorder are closing, we will be fiddling around and the freight train of the balanced budget amendment will drive over the veterans, the soldiers, the president who is trying to save this nation, homeland security resources that are needed because we want it to be a political grandstanding for a balanced budget amendment. We balanced the budget in 1993. Some suffered politically. We got the budget balance in 1997. Some suffered politically, but the Democrats knew how to do it. Let's come together balance the budget and ignore a complicated, ludicrous process that the Founding Fathers said, stop, wait, do the right thing, do your job, 
not an amendment to the Constitution. I yield back. It has expired. Gentleman from Texas. Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Kaufman. The gentleman from Colorado is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I've had the honor of serving in both the Army and the Marine Corps, uh, five overseas deployments, uh, two of them in combat. What has really struck me since I've been in the Congress of the United States uh, and had the honor as well to serve on the Armed Services Committee is testimony by former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen, who said, the greatest threat to the United States is our national debt. Not, he didn't say it was Al-Qaeda. He didn't say it was some foreign power or terrorist. He said the greatest threat to the United States is right here. The greatest threat to the United States is the decades of out-of-control spending by the Congress of the United States that is bringing down this country. And we have an opportunity today to change that. We have an opportunity today to put the discipline in place that we are not going to go down the path of Greece. I would ask the members of this body to show the same courage and determination that the young men and women show who, who serve our country in defense of our freedom every day to do the right thing and to vote for a balanced budget of the United, to the United States Constitution. If not now, when? Let us vote for this. Let us put this country down the right track. And let us not be the greatest threat to the United States. Mr. Speaker, I yield back. <clears throat> gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Michigan. I recognize the distinguished gentleman from Oregon, Oregon, Earl Blumenauer, for two minutes. The gentleman from Oregon is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate my friend with the courtesy of permitting me to speak on this. And I am here in honor of the memory of the late and I think great United States Senator from Oregon, Republican Mark Hatfield. When the balanced budget amendment freight train was moving through Congress in 1995, uh, and a number of people piled on, uh, it passed here overwhelmingly, uh, but it failed in the United States Senate by one vote. And the only Republican who voted no was Senator Mark Hatfield, who was chair of the Appropriations Committee, who understood that he was visited repeatedly by some of the most ardent proponents of a, quote, balanced budget amendment, importuning him for special treatment. Senator Hatfield understood that had that balanced budget amendment of been approved, it would have been an excuse for people to feel like they'd done their job and they could go about continuing business as usual. He took a lot of heat. He, in fact, offered his resignation to Bob Dole, offering, in fact, to resign, reducing the number of senators, and the balanced budget amendment would have failed, it would have passed. But I yield the gentleman 30 additional seconds. The gentleman is recognized for 30 But Senator Hatfield seconds. understood that that was wrong. He voted against it. It failed. And what happened? We were able to move forward under a Democratic administration to be able to rein in spending. We balanced the budget four consecutive years. What happened was when the Republicans took over, restraint was lost, deficits skyrocketed, and they put in place tax cut and spending policies that drive the deficit to this day. Reject this phony solution, stand up, provide a balance of increased revenues and program cuts. Don't pretend something that you're not doing that's not enforceable as an excuse to avoid our responsibilities. The gentleman from Texas. 
Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper, who is a member of the Armed Services Committee. The gentleman from Tennessee is recognized for two minutes. The Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mike Mullen, said that our worst enemy is not any foreign power or Al-Qaeda, it's our own national debt. That's right, it's official now. Congress has become basically America's worst enemy. I wish we would take it upon ourselves to cut spending, to balance budgets. But we are failing in doing that, and we've failed repeatedly. I wish the Super Committee would come up with a super solution. That does not look likely. I regret that we are at the stage now where we need a balanced budget amendment. And I re regret that we're at the stage of partisanship where just 10 years ago, 72 Democrats voted for this, including two out of the three top members of our leadership. We've got to live within our means. The nation's future is at stake. It's sad that we have become so lame that we need this crutch, but we need it. America's overspending, our obesity in this body is so great that we have become America's greatest obesity problem. The balanced budget amendment is the right diet. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from... To, the person, Mr. Gentleman Speaker, I have a unanimous consent request. The, uh, go ahead. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Goodlatte, control the remainder of my time. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. The gentleman from Michigan. Gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, I yield to the distinguished gentleman from Illinois, Danny Davis, for two minutes. The gentleman from Illinois is recognized for two minutes. That's great, sure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A balanced budget amendment to the Constitution represents bad economics and bad social policy. The ability to borrow helps our states and citizens is a critical tool to aid our nation during economic crisis. One of the most egregious consequences of this bill is the dangerous cuts to Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare, and other safety net programs that would result. Given the vast deficit that exists due to reckless tax cuts for the wealthy, this bill will achieve balance on the backs of the elderly, the poor, and the disabled. To achieve balance in the short term, massive reductions to critical safety net programs would have to occur. 750 billion in cuts from Medicare, 1.2 trillion from Social Security, and 85 billion from veterans' benefits through 2021. Dramatic cuts to other safety net protections for citizens, such as food stamps and supplemental security for the disabled, poor, and the elderly would almost certainly occur. To add insult to injury, nonpartisan economists with macroeconomic advisors estimate that a balanced budget amendment would eliminate 15 million jobs, increase unemployment to 18 percent, and shrink the economy by 17 percent. Catastrophic economic losses at the same time that federal safety programs to support citizens experiencing such hardships. This is a terrible piece of legislation. It's a bad bill. I could not, would not, and I don't think anybody should vote for it. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Mr. Speaker, at this time it's my pleasure to yield one and a half minutes to the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Duncan, who is a member of the Natural Resources Committee. The gentleman from South Carolina is recognized for one and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I simply ask, are you better off today than where you were four trillion dollars ago? I say not. Mr. Speaker, I come to the floor today to discuss the most important issue that we will take up this year, and that is a balanced budget amendment to the United States Constitution. For much too long, Congress has allowed mountains of debt to pile upon our children and our grandchildren. We're in debt to the tune of $15 trillion, and we continue to spend in excess of a trillion dollars more than we're bringing in each year. Now, in the short time that I've been a member of Congress, it's evident to me 
that Washington will never voluntarily make the significant cuts to spending. That's why we need to pass a balanced budget amendment that forces Washington to do what families and small businesses do each and every year, and that's live within its means. And stop the spending insanity. It's common sense. Not spending more than you have. But maybe that's too simple for those who gain some sort of power from providing the services that our nation cannot afford, spending money that we don't have. A balanced budget amendment, the right bill at the right time for America to regain control of its finances. And I yield back the balance. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I yield to the distinguished gentleman from New Jersey, Rob and Andrews, for a period of two minutes. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for two minutes. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when the Congress doesn't want to do something, it forms a committee. When we try that, it doesn't appear to be working. And then when it doesn't want to do something, it kicks the can down the road and has, sets up a process where somebody else does the hard thing. That's what we're doing here tonight. If you want to balance the budget, then vote to tell the federal operating departments to do with 5 or 10 percent less money than they got last year. I'm prepared to do that. If you want to balance the budget, then save money in the Medicare program by saying Medicare can negotiate prices of prescription drugs the way the VA does and save billions of dollars on prescription costs. I'm prepared to do that. If you want to balance the budget, bring the troops home from Afghanistan sooner. Since we have the ability to blow up the world 24 times, let's not pay for weapons that blow it up a 25th time. Let's not have 90,000 troops in Europe and Korea defending against an enemy that largely doesn't exist anymore. And if you want to balance the budget, then vote to tell the hedge fund managers and all these other people making all this money that maybe they should just pay a little bit more in taxes into the federal treasury. All the heartfelt, pious speeches tonight won't save one dollar. But the things I just talked about would. They're difficult, they're controversial, but they're real. So let's not fool the American public that some process that somebody else someday might follow will balance the budget. If you want to balance the budget, vote to cut spending. You may have ways that, that I didn't outline. I'd like to hear them. If you want to balance the budget, then vote for some people who can afford it to pay more. Do something real. That will create the balanced budget, the confidence, and the jobs the American people need. Not just another empty, hollow, meaningless political debate. The right action is to balance the budget, and the right vote on this bill is no. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time's expired. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Mr. Speaker, at this time I am pleased to yield two minutes to the distinguished gentleman from North Carolina, the ranking member of the Sea Power Subcommittee of the Armed Services Committee, Mr. McIntyre. The gentleman from, from North Carolina is recognized for two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in support of H.J. Res 2, a balanced budget constitutional amendment. With the national debt topping more than $15 trillion, it is critical that we pass this important legislation to improve our nation's economic health and national security. $48,570, that's the price we're putting on the head of every American. The portion that every man, woman, and child owes today to pay off our nation's skyrocketing federal debt. It's often said that our children and future generations will pay for the choices we make today, but the truth is, we're incurring debt at such a rapid pace that we'll begin to pay that price sooner than expected. We'll pay now as well as later. And as public debt continues to grow, including borrowing from foreign nations such as China, interest costs alone are soaring into the stratosphere. Our economy, our military strength, and the opportunity for future growth are at risk if this problem is not addressed more quickly. And that's why I stand here today to support this H.J. Res 2, a balanced budget amendment. Since first coming to Washington in 1997, I have co-sponsored legislation that would adopt 
a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. This critical legislation would require the federal government to balance its budget like most states are required to do. In fact, 49 of the 50 states have some form of a balanced budget requirement. So this is not something novel or unusual. It's something that makes common sense, including my home state of North Carolina has one of the most stringent, stringent requirements to do so. Let's stand together today for common sense. Let's send a message to the American people that we can keep our fiscal house in order, that we can balance our budget, and we can do the right thing with the American taxpayer's dollar and put our nation on a path of economic strength and vitality. I yield the remainder of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Michigan is Mr. Recognized. Speaker, I'm pleased to yield to another gentleman from North Carolina, David Price, uh, for three minutes. Gen without objection. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized for three minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise to oppose the Tea Party Caucus's latest misguided attempt to derail federal fiscal and economic policy. I understand the appeal of a simple, soundbite, friendly solution to all that ails us. In fact, some people think that balancing the budget is just a matter of cutting foreign aid, converting to a flat income tax. Many of my colleagues have stoked such nonsense and similar claims that are mathematically impossible. They know very well that balancing the budget through cuts alone would require eliminating every penny of discretionary spending, including the entire Department of Defense. I don't believe that's really what they want. Why then would they vote for this amendment? Well, there's no real risk in establishing a constitutional requirement that can't be enforced and would likely never, ever produce a balanced budget. In fact, it would make balance harder to achieve. It does absolutely nothing to create jobs or strengthen the economy, and it would put Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid in real jeopardy. But in the short term, proponents are counting on a political payoff. They'll be brandishing their I vote as proof they're the most fiscally responsible folks in the land. In fact, these emperors have no clothes. Many of my colleagues seem to have forgotten this, but we balanced the budget once before, not so long ago. It started with a bipartisan vote in 1990 and the subsequent vote by Democrats alone in 1993. Our country not only had a balanced budget, we ran four years of surpluses, and we did it without a balanced budget amendment. In fact, if the amendment we're considering tonight had been in place then, these critical agreements would have failed. The other lesson of the 1990s is that the best cure for budget deficits is a healthy economy. Here, too, the so-called balanced budget amendment would actually make things worse. Tying our hands during periods of economic downturn or high unemployment, locking in recessions, making them deeper. Mr. Speaker, in earlier years, we had some true fiscal conservatives in this body. They knew that raising the revenue needed to invest in our people and secure our economic success was a lot wiser than drawing ideological lines in the sand. They didn't need a balanced budget amendment to take tough votes, to make compromises, or to stand up for the future of our nation in the face of uncompromising pledges demanded by some group or another. As we watch the Super Committee on the brink of failure, I don't know what further proof we need that there isn't a silver bullet in the fight for fiscal security. The real answer, and I believe colleagues know this very well, isn't a matter of gimmickry. It's about mustering the political will to do the right things. I understand it's hard to revolt against King Norquist, but any Tea Party worthy of its name ought to be prepared to challenge the monarchy, not to do its bidding. I urge my colleagues to vote against this amendment. Goes back. Gentleman from Virginia is recognized. I yield myself 15 seconds uh, to Gentleman's say right. that uh, the last time that uh, the Congress balanced the budget with a Democratic-controlled Congress was 1969, uh, more than 32 years ago. At this time, it's my pleasure to yield to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. McCotter, a member of the Financial Services Committee, two minutes. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for two minutes. I thank you. I thank the gentleman from Virginia and just would like to take a quick second to add that in 1969 the Democratic Congress had a Republican president to help them do it. I rise in support of a constitutional balanced budget amendment. In this debate, we have heard that Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid will be doomed by a balanced budget amendment. But if we do nothing, those entitlement programs 
will continue to be doomed by today's fiscal implosion. We have heard the tax hikes will somehow manage to balance the budget all by themselves. But we've heard this talk before. And after all the tax hikes of the past, today we face a fiscal implosion. We have heard that there was a brief glowing era when a Democratic president and a Republican Congress managed to balance the budget. That is the exception that proves the necessity of a balanced budget amendment. Because again today, we are fiscally imploding. We have heard of the differences between how families borrow and how the government borrows. And these are absolutely accurate. When a family borrows money, it is personally liable for that debt. It must prioritize its finances and pay it back with its own money. But today we are fiscally imploding because big government is not personally liable for that debt. It does not prioritize and it can't even pay it back with other people's money. What is the solution? My belief is that big government is addicted to spending, so we must turn it over to a higher power called the United States Constitution. Only in this way, when Congress spends your money, will you be allowed in the room to sit over their shoulder and say no. Because as we know, today's fiscal implosion is here. Because under statutory limitations, the Congress has not been able to balance your budget. Go to the highest law of the land, force them to live within your means, and ensure that the doom and gloom we hear about being able to spend less money to help America actually occurs. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to recognize the distinguished gentle lady from California. Oakland, California, Barbara Lee, for a period of two minutes. The gentlelady from California is recognized for two minutes. Thank you. I want to thank the gentleman for yielding and for continuing uh, to fight the good fight on behalf of the American people. Many of my Republican colleagues have come to the floor to keep telling us that the federal government must balance the budget just like every American family. Well, it sounds like it makes sense to me, but it's nonsense. How would those families and businesses feel about Congress passing a constitutional amendment making it illegal to borrow money to invest in their futures? What if they could not get a mortgage to buy a house? What if they could not get a credit card to buy a car or get credit, mind you, just to buy some clothes? What if they could not get a loan to grow their businesses? That's what this fundamental change to America's Constitution would do to the entire country. Can you imagine opening up the Constitution to make it impossible for people to invest in their future? In addition, millions of families across America are taking in less income than they need to survive because of failed Republican economic policies that drove our economy into the ditch. Why would you now want to balance the budget on the backs of these people? Seniors, the poor, our children, the most vulnerable. Now that people need a helping hand, Republicans want to tie the hands of government and restrict our budget so that exactly when Americans need more, you want to hurt them more. This is really a moral disgrace. Let's stop wasting time on ridiculous efforts to amend our Constitution when millions of Americans need jobs now. Let's stop wasting time keeping campaign promises to Republican Tea Party supporters and pass real legislation that will create jobs like the American Jobs Act. Let's stop wasting time when nearly 50 million Americans, mind you, 50 million in the richest and most powerful country in the world, 50 million, may I have another 30 seconds? Please recognize. Thank you very much for the 30 seconds. But I just wanted to remind us all that 50 million Americans are living in poverty in the wealthiest and most powerful country in the world, and millions of job seekers are about to lose their unemployment benefits. We do not need to radically alter our nation's founding document to do what is right. We just have to take a balanced approach to reducing our deficits and balancing our, budget, our budgets, and you do this by creating jobs. So let the unwise Bush tax cuts expire. 
end the wars, cut the bloated and wasteful Pentagon spending, and protect the social safety net that protects millions of Americans. The gentlelady's time has expired. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Mr. Speaker, it's my uh, distinct pleasure to yield four minutes to the gentleman from Texas, the chairman of the House Republican Conference, Mr. Henseling. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for four minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding and thank him for his leadership on the balanced budget amendment. Mr. Speaker, since the President was elected, our nation has now seen its first trillion dollar deficit, its second trillion dollar deficit, and its third trillion dollar deficit. The President and the previous Congress has been on a spending spree the likes of which this nation has never seen before. And yesterday, Americans were greeted with the news that our national debt has now topped $15 trillion, $128,000 for every household. We are borrowing almost 40 cents on the dollar, much of it from the Chinese, and sending the bill to our children and grandchildren. In short, there is a debt crisis. The debt is not just unsustainable, it is immoral. And the American people know that it's because Washington spends too much, not because they are undertaxed. The problem is on the spending side. Now, taxes are temporarily down due to the economy, but they're going to come back. It is spending that is exploding from 20% of our economy to 40% over the course of the next generation. If that's solved on the taxing side, we'd be the most highly taxed industrialized nation in the world. Now, the crisis should be solved on the spending side of the equation. I wish we were debating a spending limit amendment to the Constitution. We're not. We had no takers. I know of no takers on the other side of the aisle. So we are debating what is known as the classic balanced budget, the jump ball ba balanced budget, the clean balanced budget, equal opportunities for spending restraint and tax increases. Now, it's not my preferred policy. Yet so many Democrats, Mr. Speaker, will come to the floor and say we need a balanced approach. But the question is, how many believe we need a balanced budget? Now, we all agree that amending the Constitution is something that should be taken with great reverence, with great deliberation. It is a sacred responsibility. But, Mr. Speaker, we know that our founding fathers set up a process by which to amend the Constitution, and no less of a founding father than Thomas Jefferson said, I wish it were possible to obtain a single amendment to our Constitution. I would be willing to depend on that alone for the reduction of the administration of our government. I mean an additional article taking from the federal government the power of borrowing. Forty-nine of fifty states have some form of balanced budget requirement. Every family in America has to balance their budget. Every small business. Should we expect anything less from a great nation? Sixteen years ago was the last opportunity we had in the United States Congress to vote on a balanced budget. It came within one vote. One vote in the United States Senate. Imagine where we would be today had that one vote made the difference and we had this amendment. It's sad. I can tell you, Republicans and Democrats can't seem to agree on spending. We can't seem to agree on taxes. But as Americans, can't we at least agree it's past time, past time to stop mortgaging our children's future and bankrupting the greatest nation in the history of the world? There is a real crisis and to paraphrase Winston Churchill, haven't we now exhausted every other possibility? Isn't it finally time to do the right thing? Amend the Constitution, save the country, balance the budget. I yield back.